On the morning of December 7, 1941, the Japanese Armada was 200 miles north of Hawaii. The Naval Task Force, spearheaded by six Japanese aircraft carriers, launched 353 planes in two waves. Their mission was to destroy American military installations and aircraft on the ground throughout the islands. But the main prize was the American Navy and the battleships that lay at anchor at Pearl Harbor. The attack began at 7.48 a.m. I was awakened by the bed shaking, the windows rattling, and I thought to myself, the GD Army is doing war games again. Larson was stationed at the Diamond Head Lighthouse, and as he scrambled out of bed, what he saw left a chilling memory. Three torpedo planes flew over me that Sunday morning, and I could see the rivets on the side, you know, the canopy. The Japanese torpedo pilots targeted the battleships that were moored right next to each other at Pearl with merciless accuracy. Around 8 o'clock, I heard this noise, and then the general quarter sounded and landed your battle stations. John Rauschkolb was enjoying a cup of coffee aboard the Bridge of the West Virginia when he happened to glance off the port side of his ship. I could see a Japanese plane headed for my ship. I felt six torpedoes hit the port side of my ship. The U.S. Navy said seven. The Japanese said nine, and two bombs. And that big bomb that sank the Arizona, they had one of those specially designed for each battleship in the harbor. The one that hit the West Virginia came down pretty close to me on the starboard side. Went down three decks and didn't explode, just sat there. But the one that hit the Arizona hit the forward magazine and it blew up that whole magazine, and that's what destroyed the ship. Chaos and confusion swept through the harbor as the Japanese unloaded countless torpedoes and bombs. And I was getting ready to go ashore when the first torpedo slammed into our port side, aerial torpedoes they were, and uh, within the seconds, the second one hit us. And, and then the, the ship began to list a bit, but we knew that the prime idea was to get out of there in a hurry. Despite talk of war for months, there was almost a sense of disbelief when the Japanese finally did attack. I spotted those planes, but I didn't know they were Japanese. I said, they were just peppering the hell out of the, out of the water on the, on the bay, and I said, man, what a good mock battle until I saw one drop a torpedo and hit the West Virginia, and I said, man, this is the real thing. Gene Turan had been on Liberty at a luau the night before the attack. Hell, I had a hangover, and all of a sudden, I saw the swoop down and come down at a very low angle, heading for where the battleships were located, and they released torpedoes, and I saw the Arizona take about three of them and, and start sinking. I thought, oh, hell, this is, we, we got a war going on. Mickey Gandich was getting ready to play the Arizona in a fleet championship football game. He was in his uniform when the call came to man your battle stations, and he climbed topside to the crow's nest as a lookout. Planes coming in just like a nightmare. Buildings burning, ships burning, ships rolling over. At six minutes after 8 a.m., the Arizona blew up and sank with a loss of 1,177 sailors out of a crew of 1,400. The Oklahoma capsized and the Utah also sunk. Trapped below decks, men scrambled to get topside. Went up uh, to the main deck and we were being heavily strafed. By the time we got to the main deck, we knew we were under attack. The uh, bullets, from the strafing were ricocheting 
around quite a bit. The California and the Nevada sunk. The Maryland and the Tennessee were heavily damaged. The second wave of Japanese planes destroyed most of the American planes on the ground. Aboard the USS West Virginia, the command, all hands, abandoned ship, was given. There were a lot of sailors lying on deck, unconscious. We didn't know whether they were alive or dead. And there was a group of sailors working there, getting them to another group of sailors, to getting to medical help. So what I did at that point, would uh, I'd grab the sailor's hair and pull real hard. If I got a groan, a moan, or don't do that, I knew he was alive, I would take him out. If I didn't get a response, I let him lay because I didn't have time to take dead sailors out for help. Martin Hoops was stationed aboard the battleship Pennsylvania, which was in dry dock. But the day before the attack, he'd been transferred to the hospital ship Solus for a minor operation. That morning, the patients aboard the Solus were pressed into duty to help the men that had been wounded in the attack on Pearl. What they did immediately is taken all the patients that they operated on out of their beds and, and put them into the, with the crews. Uh, the small boats were out picking up people in the water that were burnt. Some of their arms were blown off and all big, bad things happened to them and they were bringing them aboard all the time. 90 minutes after the attack began, it was over. The American fleet had just about been destroyed. A number of men were still struggling to stay alive and get off of sinking, flaming coffins. Most men were stunned and still in shock. Some sailors counted their blessings. Tony Jalepis, the tough kid from South San Francisco, was counting other things. I had $120 on the books, and that's two months wages, you know, and I was thinking about everything else, what the, what's gonna happen? I was saving it for Christmas to send home. And I was wondering what the hell is gonna happen to my 120 bucks? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you think crazy things, you know, but you don't tell that to uh, the crew. You're, of course, you're all together and doing what you can, and that was it. <laughs>